So my name's Steven Shi. Uh, I work at a company called Alchemy, and I'll talk to you about yeah, active learning on Kubernetes and SageMaker. So let's say you're a, a business analyst. Oftentimes, you get documents in your inbox, and you double click on the document, you open it up, you look for a specific chart or table or text that you want to extract, and you go and highlight it, press Control C or Command C if you're on a Mac, and then you paste it into a structured data store. And nothing better than Excel, of course, right? Uh, so that's the kind of workflow we've seen a lot in the financial services domain. We see data being passed as documents, and a user, a business analyst, has a manual process for simply copying that data and ingesting it into a structured data store. That's sort of what we're trying to tackle here. We're trying to build a platform to provide self-automation to these business users in order to turn their documents into data automatically. And we're a startup, which is why we're here in the Startup Central. Um, so we're a small team, but we mostly come from the financial services domain. Uh, our CEO is from Bloomberg. Um, or the AI and NLP domain. So we've worked at X.AI in the past, as well as other startups like Handy, I guess not such a startup anymore, but <laughs> uh, and myself at Two Sigma previously. Okay. So how do we actually use machine learning in our platform? When we get a document that's ingested into our platform, we first apply a computer vision model. And this model is trained to detect structural components, things that are generic across documents, but might be something that users want to extract. So in this case, you see in this uh, research report, we've identified structural elements of paragraphs. Uh, our model also detects things like charts and tables. And this computer vision model works similar to how self-driving cars might work. We detect bounding boxes, and we apply labels to them. And we identify these elements. Now, out of all of these paragraphs, we don't actually know what the uh, user is looking for. And that's where this secondary machine learning model comes into place. It's what we call a selection model, and it's what we use to select the exact element that the user wants to extract. So in this case, out of all of these paragraphs, maybe the user is looking specifically for things that mention LIBOR in order to revise a document. So they would go and pick one of these paragraphs to tell our system that this is actually what we want to extract. As I mentioned in the previous slide, we have this user input. We have a loop that involves the user in order to give us the input in order to train the machine learning model. And that's where active learning comes into place. So wh what is active learning? It's basically an interactive dialogue that occurs between the labeler, in our case, the business user, and the machine learning model. So the way this works is that when we have a lot of unlabeled documents, we want to pick the ones that give us the best lift in our model. We want to be able to automatically identify which uh, examples would lead to the best improvement in our system and show that to the user. And in the end, what we get is a more accurate model while requiring less labeled data. Let's see how this looks. Let's say on the left here, we start with some kind of a base machine learning model. W this model is used to give predictions as well as confidence scores to a labeled data set. From this labeled data set, we can sort or apply some kind of a ranking function in order to extract or to select the examples that would give us the biggest lift. These are the ones we present to the labeler, who then labels these examples these get added to an existing uh, labeled data set, and then the retraining process occurs. And once the new model is trained, it's immediately redeployed. And at that point, the dialogue continues. We have a smarter model, and the user should hopefully benefit from those uh, labels that it just applied. And start. Um, the model should just be able to detect the elements that they were just labeled. Okay. So let's see how this looks in our platform. So in this case, let's say we've had a couple, well, these are fake documents. Um, our model is great at detecting elements from one of these uh, funds, in this case, the Churro Capital Fund. Um, but you see, we get another fund here called the ABC Group, but we're not able to actually identify the elements. So this is where it gets handed off to the human in order to label. 
the user would click into one of these documents and present it with these structural elements that I mentioned earlier. In this case, this is almost entirely tables. So when the, doc the user sees this, they would pick the elements that refer to the things that they're looking for, like the fund return. Okay. Once they're labeled, this element now, ABC group, is now added to the training data set. And the model is immediately retrained. Okay. So once the model is retrained, the predictions for the remainder of these unlabeled documents are immediately applied. And you see they're marked as red because we still have a low confidence on them, but the user immediately benefits from the labels that were just applied to the data set. So that's how the user interacts with in active learning. Here's a architecture diagram of how this is actually implemented on AWS. Uh, so on the left here, we have unstructured documents. These are run through models that we host on SageMaker Predict. And given the results or the predictions, we have high and low confidence documents. High confidence documents are immediately sent to a structured data store, while low confidence documents are sent to an annotation queue. These are presented to the user and the user can then label these uh, documents. They're added to an S3 bucket as labeled data, and it's retrained using SageMaker train. So this is um, an example of how we actually, oh, got lots of presentation. Yeah, so this is an example of the loop using SageMaker. A little bit of code. I don't think it matters too much what the code is here, but I want to point out SageMaker has a great API. Uh, this is Python. And we can instantiate an estimator in SageMaker. Um, and this is what um, the estimator you know, does the prediction as well as the training. So here we specify the image name to use, how many instances we want to train with, the instance type, and where do we actually want to output these uh, model artifacts. And then we could train it or fit the estimator using our training data set. When the estimator is ready and is trained, a uh, simple call to dot deploy would actually deploy this and make it available for predictions. So the code is pretty simple uh, using the SageMaker API. What I showed you just earlier in those um, slides was code to use SageMaker to train and predict. And SageMaker trains and predicts uh, these models using virtual machines. Now these are virtual machines are great for resource isolation, um, but the downside is they're slow to deploy. And recall how we mentioned with active learning, we want an interactive dialogue between the user and the model. So we want this training loop to be as fast as possible. The moment we get labeled data, we want to kick off the retraining, and we want to present the new predictions to the user as fast as possible. So that's where we got to thinking, well, you know, we are training things uh, on SageMaker, with virtual machines, can we make it faster with containers? And we're running our systems on Kubernetes, so we instinctively thought, well, can we use Kubernetes instead to reduce the iteration from minutes to potentially seconds? Basically, it's not too hard to replicate the process that SageMaker does in order to train and predict, uh, train and deploy the model. In this case, all we have to do is copy our training artifacts to an S3 location, and from there, we can actually reuse the exact same SageMaker image that we built to kick off the training process. Uh, so as you see here, it really is just untarring a model artifact and then kicking off the training process, then taking any of those artifacts that are generated and pushing it back to S3. Uh, redeploying is a very similar process. Now, once the model is trained, it just means grabbing the model, model artifacts from S3, putting it in the container, and kicking off the, um, the predictor. So what we do on Kubernetes is pretty simple here. We use a config map in order to store the latest S3 path in order to share between the training and deployment process. And from that, these two uh, deployments, or the, the job for training and the deployment for prediction, can actually talk with one another. Uh, so actually, that's, the, um, that's my talk. Basically, I wanted to introduce you to the concept of active learning. It's a dialogue that occurs between the modeler, uh, the model and the labeler. And what it really requires is a fast train, 
deploy and prediction loop. So in, that, in this scenario, we really wanted to be fast. So using the SageMaker API natively took a bit of time. It took in the order of minutes in order to do the training and deployment loop. But if we use the container service instead, these models train in seconds. So one of the things we do give up, though, using containers is that we don't get the same resource isolation and provisioning that SageMaker gives us. In particular, it's really nice that SageMaker gives us the ability to just launch a GPU machine in order to do the training job. But what we found is that for the most part, uh, for models that aren't too complicated, uh, containers are a really good way to go and really sped up our um, train and deploy loop. Great, thank you. So if anyone has any questions, just raise your, raise your hand and I'll come to you. I have a few questions actually. Oh, uh, did you get the Hello? Yep. Yeah, did you uh, develop the OCR yourself for the PDF documents to do the table extraction? Oh, sorry, I'll, I'll repeat the question. Yeah. So the question was, do we do the OCR or PDF tech table extraction ourselves, or is that some open source component? I'd say it's a mixture of both. Um, we definitely use the, OC, uh, the uh, open source components like Tesseract and um, a table extraction. Um, but we also supplement it with a computer vision model that really gives us the ability to find things that are more relevant than just like analyzing an entire document. So I guess the question was, can I do the extraction independently of the rest of the pipeline? Um, I'd say yes, but that's not really the strength of our platform. Because we've supplemented it with this sort of identifying the structural components first, we found that that is what really gives us the precise results that we need. If we were to apply the extraction across the entire document without sort of narrowing down specifically what section we want to um, run the extraction on, um, we found that that just was, um, it wasn't that helpful in the end, like, yeah, yep. Uh, <laughs> ah, okay, so the question is, uh, what kind of uh, resources what am I talking about when I say resource isolations in this slide? Uh, so that's a good question. Um, specifically, when you launch uh, SageMaker, you have to pick an instance type to run. And the instance type gives you um, properties like disk size, uh, CPU, memory, as well as number of GPUs. And those are the resources I'm talking about. When we run the job on Kubernetes, these containers are sharing the same nodes with many other processes. So we may be able to isolate potentially or limit the CPU and memory usage, but sometimes you know, processes could run you know, beyond the capabilities of what they say they need. And, um, especially for training jobs, which are very compute or GPU heavy. Yeah, exactly, so. All right, we have a question oh. over here. Yeah. Hi. You have mentioned in the slide that oh. you build mo more accurate models with less labeled data, right? Yeah. In general, each labeled data adds more value to the model and improves its accuracy, with which you are comparing with and saying that with less labeled data, you are producing accurate model. On what basis you are saying that, and how, how is it possible? I see. So the question is, like, how is it that we're able to um, build better models with less labeled data by using this active learning loop? So this hypothesis here is that Given a certain ranking function, like we could say the predictions with the lowest confidence, um, if we were to label those, oftentimes these are the things that the model is less capable at or, or more unsure about. So these are examples that generally the model hasn't seen as often. So by prioritizing those labels, we sort of build a model that's better trained kind of to cover the, the universe of examples as opposed to just one specific example. I think oftentimes, like if you were to just pick from the top of the list, you may be labeling things that are all roughly the same in structure. Uh, if you were to pick things randomly, 
that gives you lift as well, but it's not as smart as I think specifically saying, you know, what am I not good at? And that's generally the hypothesis behind this uh, active learning iteration. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I'm not sure this is working. Oh, yeah. I could hear. Yeah, just one quick question. What kind of models you have been used to for the calculating the, you know, the probability or confidence levels? Because you said like a l high confidence, low confidence, or you just relying on one model or like more than like five or six different models to give ah. you a, like a majority vote mm -hmm. on that one? Oh, so the question, I guess, relates to the models themselves. And this is actually a great time for me to point out our chief data scientist who's standing right there. Uh, that's Adam. Um, so he knows the nitty-gritty details of uh, the models themselves. Uh, I can speak a bit more to the deployment process, but um, yeah. So. Uh, would you know if this would be a good um, setup for reinforcement learning? Because that can be really important for active machine learning processes. So my understanding of reinforcement learning is like, extremely shallow, so I want to again point you to Adam, who probably can give you a better answer there. Um, but I think really this idea of just predicting and deploying and just having this loop of building s increasingly better models is, is just extremely useful, especially when the infrastructure supports it well. Um, and I think that's just generally kind of what we found is really helpful in our platform.